As we mark the beginning of EMS Week, I wanted to take the opportunity for thanking you all for what you do. While in our profession, sacrifice and commitment to our communities and patients has always been our guiding star, it could not be more true than it is now. Resilience is the ability to mentally or emotionally cope with a crisis or to return to pre-crisis status quickly. After several months of dealing with this pandemic, however, we know a return to a pre-crisis normalcy will be anything but quick. Stay resilient, my brothers and sisters in EMS, for we are called to do God's work and we have no choice but to persevere. Lean on one another and seek help if you need it, for we have all seen and responded to situations during this pandemic that will leave an indelible mark. It is a somber EMS week, but thank you, thank you, thank you all for always being in service. On today's episode, we'll be discussing operationalizing cardiac arrest during this pandemic. The Northeast in particular has seen a dramatic increase in the number of cardiac arrest call types. The etiology of this rise, while multifactorial, stem not only from COVID itself, but also the effects the pandemic has on typical protocols, in addition to patients delaying urgent care and evaluation due to the fear of infection while in the hospital. Today's guest is Chief Juan Cardona. He is the division chief in charge of emergency medical services and has served for 26 years in the Coral Springs Parkland Fire Department in Florida. Chief Cardona is a firefighter and a paramedic and obtained his master's degree from Barry University. He received the appointment for chief EMS officer by the Center for Public Safety Excellence. Chief Cardona is an international writer and lecturer who collaborates to improve the profession of firefighters and emergency medical systems throughout the world. In the episode, we will of course discuss some of the medical considerations, logistic considerations, and best practices for infection control, in addition to the psychological toll on families and providers, some of whom in New York City, for example, have had shifts where they've done back to back to back to back cardiac arrest calls. Without further ado, Chief Juan Cardona. Hello and welcome to the EMS Nation podcast. How are you, Chief? I'm great, Doc. How are you? We're doing well. We're doing well, all things considered. Uh, Happy EMS week to you and your crews. Uh, We're so excited to have you on the show to really get excited uh, and into this conversation on operationalizing cardiac arrest. How are things in Florida? Well, we're doing great and happy EMS week to you and, and your department as well. Everybody that has gone through such a hard time over the last couple of months. But um, we're, we're, you know, we're moving forward. We continue to work hard and um, thank God things have uh, started to look a little bit better. Um, we're seeing some of the changes, some of the positive uh, transitions. And I think that that's what we'd like to head. So let's just continue to keep it that way. Uh, I'm optimistic, a little cautiously optimistic, but let's see, let's see how we go from here. Absolutely. Could not agree with you more, sir. And then just before we launch into the content, you have uh, such an incredible history uh, in EMS and you've done some amazing things over your career. Can you share with us a little bit about, you know, your, um, some of your big wins and uh, how you have worked hard diligently to rise to the level of chief in, down in Parkland? Well, well, I appreciate your words. And, uh, and by the way, you, you are a little bit, uh, you know, overstating what I think has been a uh, uh, a great career, a great, a great life. Uh, I've, been, I've been in EMS for now a total of 26 years. I started off as a paramedic and um, I worked for an ambulance company for a couple of years. And then I transitioned to the department that I'm at right now, which is the Coral Springs Parkland Fire Department. We are in the Broward County area, a little bit in, uh, west of Fort Lauderdale. And, uh, you know, we're a pretty, a pretty uh, uh, affluent community. We have a really good combination of calls run about 15,000 calls a year, of which about 12,000 are EMS-related calls. Mm. And it's been a great career. It's been, it's been great being part of a department that uh, has uh, evolved and has moved and transitioned towards becoming um, you know, a department that's been able to set trends and to, and to be a, a role model and a best practice model for many other agencies. Uh, we were lucky enough that we were selected as the EMS provider of the year uh, back in 2017, and, and that was a great honor. 
And, uh, you know, besides my department, one thing that I've always been passionate about is being able to transmit that the things that, that, that we have learned through all the work that we do in, in EMS in the U.S. and bring that out to other parts of the world. So I've been lucky enough to get connected with people like you who also do the same things and, and be able to, to tell others, hey, you know, maybe we, we've learned some things and maybe this is something that we can share and, and here it is. So uh, there's nothing more than I love than, than uh, doing what I do, but also, but also jumping on a plane on a, on a weekend and heading somewhere outside of the U.S. to share the things that we have learned. And that's something that I miss right now, COVID mm. times, no travel. I can't wait to get back on a plane. But in the meantime, <laughs> we continue to do what we're doing and, and we have fun doing it. So again, thank you for your words. Thanks so much for the introduction, Chief. And we actually met... Uh, by a mutual friend of ours, Dave Page, who runs the uh, UCLA uh, Evidence-Based Medicine podcast and, you know, oftentimes re is reviewing articles in EMS. And it was actually a privilege to meet you for the very first time on a live webinar uh, that we did for the Spanish-speaking world on the, all the nuances, COVID management strategies, uh, you know, starting from EMS response all the way to the ICU course. And that was my very first webinar uh, in uh, full Spanish, which was very challenging, but wow. I'm grateful that people uh, <laughs> were uh, accepting of uh, the knowledge that we were trying to share. But that was an incredible um, gift that, um, you know, Dave and yourself were able to provide for the community. Well, I'm impressed that I didn't know that that was your first uh, webinar in Spanish. You did really good, I got to tell you. And, uh, <laughs> and let me tell you, le learning from your experiences and the things that you guys have, have been dealing with up in New York and, uh, you know, you sharing what you know, and, and, and it's just awesome. Uh, it's, it's, again, it's, it's that, it's, that's the, the kind of thing that I love and that I'm, that I'm so passionate about, be able to learn from, from other experiences. And I know you guys have not had an easy time uh, in your area with what's happening. So, again, you know, kudos to you, kudos to, to, to your personnel. You guys have done uh, amazing work and, uh, you know, just continue to do what you're doing and continue to stay safe. That's the important things. Well, that's a great way to transition into the conversation because we really did hone in on that webinar on cardiac arrest, specifically related to COVID. And one thing that we're seeing in New York State, but particularly in New York City, is an exponential increase in cardiac arrest calls. And um, we can spend some time hypothesizing about why that is. And in fact, we have a, a, a whole podcast uh, dedicated to that, ASAP, the American College of Emergency Physicians, has put out a statement um, recently that is describing how so many people are avoiding uh, care in the emergency department just because of the fear of interacting or being placed in a room adjacent to or somewhere close to you know, a patient who has uh, COVID. And it's resulted in a whole host of problems that we're only beginning to see, which um, is challenging, but from the flip side on in regards to operationalizing the response, I thought the way that your department had prepared for cardiac arrest was fantastic. So let's get into it. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so you are absolutely correct. There's just so many implications when it comes to dealing with or, or thinking about just thinking about cardiac arrest management in the field um, during COVID times, you know, and, and it just makes you wonder about the things that, that maybe we have thought about before, but we really have to think hard right now and ask ourselves all those questions. So there's always a question of, of protocols and, and how, how, what kind of protocols do we have? What kind of guidelines and, and, and parameters do, do we have put in place so that we can provide our crews with the safest and most accurate information so, so that they can make those hard decisions that we're asking them to make in the field? You know, we, we, have, we have to think about the fact that this, this, this is war time. We're, we're fighting an enemy and this enemy, which is a very tiny enemy, has taken over the world. It started in one location, now it's spread to the rest of the world. The entire world is fighting this enemy. And we have to consider ourselves that this, this, is, this, is, this is the time to practice wartime medicine. And mm -hmm. we, with that mindset, we have to think about non-conventional weapons. So we have to think about the thing that we probably haven't thought about before. So when we think about cardiac arrest, we said ourselves, you know, what, you said it very well. People are not, people are actually refraining from calling 911 for fear of having to go to an emergency room or a hospital and be infected with COVID. And, and you can only imagine the look on the patient's face and their relatives also, you know, when their loved one is being taken uh, by an ambulance, by a rescue truck to, a, to an emergency room, um, um, you know, a hospital or a hospital emergency room. So think about that for a second and you go, you say to yourself, that, that could be the last time that relative is ever going to see their dad or their, their wife or their, or their child. And it's a scary time. And if we put ourselves in their situation, we, we, we would really want to have, uh, you know, th that clarity of mind 
to know that that's what we got to do for our patients and, and not just not only for them but also for our own crews again so they have the clear direction clearest possible direction you as a medical director your role is so important uh, i can only i can only imagine what you deal with in terms of trying to trying to think about doing what what you think in your mind is the right thing to do considering all of the ramifications of whether it's legal whether they are financial logistical and just in general cultural i mean that's another issue right there you're, you're in new york a, a multicultural city not that the rest of the u.s is not but new york is just that i mean everybody from all over the world is there and there's so many different ways of looking at life and death and so many ways of looking at being sick or not being sick that you have to take those things into account i can tell you that i can only imagine how much more difficult your job is in, in terms of having to consider all those things right there and the last one i want to mention on this slide and we have a conversation about this is triage this is the time to do triage and it's the triage that is not your typical you know typical triage rpm it's not your typical triage tags with green yellow red black no this is a time to think about when it comes to cardiac arrest considerations as simple as should we initiate or not initiate uh, efforts to resuscitate the patient should we take a minute to look at all the things that we should consider before we even get or we start and going to immediately look at those variables and seeing how everything adds up to make a decision whether to transport or not. So, I mean, what do you think about that? And all these things are so crucial. I hope everyone is thinking about these things right now. Yeah, that's a great introduction into the topic. And um, all those points are sincerely worthwhile. One thing that I thought uh, was really of note, and I think is um, most people probably underappreciate, but you know, when family members see their relative going to the hospital, uh, it could really be potentially be the last time they see them because most hospitals, if not all in the country, have uh, really restricted visitation of uh, family and relatives, um, of course, because of the spread of the virus and you know, for the protection of our uh, in-hospital providers and for the patient's family members. But you know, the visitation policies are so strict. And again, it's all public safety. But it really does lead us to have a deeper conversation regarding triage. And during the pandemic, and I think that's one of the historical components, um, you know, when the president declared a public emergency nationally, uh, the nature of the tenor um, allowed us to, you know, operationalize and change EMS protocols and do things just like we would in wartime medicine that would not otherwise be allowable. And so in New York State, with a dramatic increase in cardiac arrest protocols, Part of what we had gotten into uh, was a conversation um, on our previous webinar was um, the controversial, uh, the nature of the protocol was changed to be that, you know, actually working up a cardiac arrest was not mandatory. And there were certain criteria that were set out if it was an unwitnessed arrest, if the patient was asystolic that providers could make the decision to um, actually not initiate uh, CPR or even DLS or ACLS. And the reason specifically in New York State is that the exponential increase in the total number of arrests, and there were over almost 200 cardiac arrests per day within New York City itself, which made things particularly challenging. And thankfully now, um, things are improving certainly, and we've dialed that back. And another, you know, consideration there that people may not realize in regards to the controversy is during the height of the pandemic in New York City is that both, as you mentioned, hospital capacity was significantly limited. So even if they initiated CPR, um, you know, they and they were uh, attempting to transport, the hospital itself potentially may not have been able to receive that patient because the number of critical patients that were you know, intubated in the ED, you know, waiting ICU beds was incredible. And now pulling a team of six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 people to resuscitate this patient was incredibly challenging. And in the same time, um, in-hospital providers were also starting to be furloughed because in the very beginning of the pandemic, PPE was questionable and short supply. And we actually didn't know um, the safest way to treat a patient with COVID. So, so many challenging things to consider in regards to cardiac arrest management in the age of COVID um, specifically. Doc, you, you mentioned five or six or seven points in, in a short period of time. So again, it, it is these kinds of things that, that I think everyone should be thinking about, everyone should be considering, uh, you know, exploring and studying and, and definitely looking for best practice models out there 
to, to see what it is that they want to do in their communities. And, and, and you said it. I mean, relatives seeing their, their, their loved ones being transported and maybe not seeing them for, you know, ever again at that point. And it's a very, very tough topic to talk about because the ethical considerations are also huge. Um, I've talked to friends about this, and some, of, some friends of mine disagree with my position, and they say, well, listen, I joined this career to save lives, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to save a life. Well, that's great. That's a great position to be in. I think we all share that passion. But a lot of times, it's not just our contribution alone that's going to make that patient have uh, you know, good chances of survival, but also the entire system. And, and you said it. What's going to happen in the hospital? What are, they, what are the capabilities of that emergency room hospital to handle a patient that's coming in now? with suspected COVID-19, and maybe there aren't proper PPE uh, logistical uh, precautions in place. Maybe there aren't enough, enough uh, nurses and paramedics and ER doctors to handle the, you know, one more cardiac arrest. So all these things are important. So we have to consider, you said it, whether the arrest is witnessed or not witnessed. That's, a, that's one key point right there. Another one is whether the, whether the patient's found in a shockable or a non-shockable rhythm. We know that the expectation of survival is going to decrease based on how the, the heart progresses if the patient goes from a from a shockable to a non-shockable rhythm and time start you, you know uh, you know working against them by by decreasing survival chances by 10 percent for every minute of delay we got we got to talk about or think about also the possibility of that patient surviving the hospital to discharge and whether they're going to be uh, neurologically inta intact i mean is are they going to have a quality of life Listen, again, the, I know we cannot answer the question. I know there's a question that we're not going to have the answers at the moment we have we come across a patient. But these are questions that, that, that have to be put on the table. And with a strong medical director and a strong leadership team, decisions have to be made and protocols have to be put in place so that our crews can have those tools to make those difficult decisions in the field. We know that the CARES register tells us that the survival rate of patients found in asystole and cardiac arrest it's pretty much zero in the last 10 years. So we cannot expect that to change, especially now in times of COVID-19. We know the things that, that, that COVID does and, and how, how it affects our patients. So it definitely worsens the outcome um, for, for our patients if we do come across those kinds of situations. So I go back again to what I said earlier, uh, strong medical direction, strong leadership, plenty of information, factual uh, evidence-based medicine, uh, and taking into account all of the considerations uh, around around making the decision to work or not work to transport or not transport that patient to the hospital, coupled with direct access to the medical director right then and there to say, this is where I'm at, this is where I have, and maybe even considering giving that patient a good solid 20 minutes or 30 minutes, depending on what local protocols, of good solid uh, BLS and ACLS workup and see how they progress. If that patient remains in a systole after 20 minutes, that patient is not surviving. There is nothing that EMS uh, is not able to do that the hospital can do differently to save a, a person who's been in cardiac arrest for a prolonged period of time. If we keep all those things into account, if we also, if we also focus, like some of the departments are doing right now, on utilizing certain adjuncts and devices that can minimize the spread of the, of, of the virus, uh, if they do decide to work the patient, then we can have some level of assurance maybe some level of comfort that we're doing the right thing, we're giving the patient the right, the, the right chances of survival while still protecting ourselves, the hospital, the family, the community. Beautiful, and then I see here now, invasive procedures only if necessary. And these are some great takeaways, you know, for departments in terms of operationalizing their protocols to um, developing an approach to cardiac arrest. And not only do providers need appropriate PPE, but a lot of your interventions that are listed here are to limit uh, the patient's ability to be a potential vector, even though they're in cardiac arrest. You know, performing CPR is you know essentially pressing on their chest wall. You're forcing ex exhalation is going to aerosolize the virus. So I love some of your uh, of your strategies here. And, we, and we've done that, and, and most parts of the country and the world have taken uh, some of these considerations and put them in place. And we say, you know, supraglottic airways versus and tracheal intubation. And there's different versions, there's different studies that say, that recommend one thing versus the other. We just have to make sure that we know what it is that we think we want to utilize. And it's not always just one device or one adjunct or one particular process. It's, it's a whole combination of different things that tells us this is what we think works, and that's what we think we recommend our crews to do. Epi-1-1000, IM, for, for severe asthma, you know, as opposed to even a patient of utilized, uh, I'm sorry, a, a nebulized albuterol treatment, which, as we know, could aerosolize um, particles and spread the virus from the patient's airway. 
uh, utilizing the line endoscopy to try and keep a distance between, between our face, even though we're in full PPE, and the patient's uh, you know, airway uh, to, to, to limit the spread of, 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 uh, of uh, infection. Uh, the utilization of patient capsules, we've seen them. I've seen them on the, at the trade shows, $5,000, $7,000 for a capsule. There's questions about decontamination. There's questions about affordability. There, there are places that are departments in the U.S. and in the rest of the world that can't afford to, get to, have, to buy this type of equipment, this type of, uh, of, of uh, capsules. And we talked about this during our podcast for Latin America, and, 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 I, and I mentioned that I can appreciate the many creative ways in which some systems, not only in the U.S., but also in other parts of the world, have decided to come up with their own um, ideas and their, and their own uh, protective devices or, or, or things. Again, I, I go back to what I said at the beginning. This is wartime. This is not the time to think conventionally. We have to utilize non-conventional weapons. And sometimes a piece of plastic, visqueen, maybe a structure made of a PVC, wood, whatever it takes might be uh, enough to create some sort of barrier between the patient and cardiac arrest that's being worked by a crew that's also wearing PPE. It's like I tell my firefighters in my department, I tell them all the time, it's not about eradicating or removing completely the risk of infection. It's about decreasing it as much as we can. It's about hitting on different components that when we add them all up, give us a pretty good amount of, of, of benefit versus the risk. Hopefully the risk is minimal, but the risk will never go away. We'll just have to continue to keep thinking outside the box and, and, and bringing up any ideas that we think might work and these are some of those ideas. What exactly, just for folks who may not be aware, is a patient capsule? So if, you, if you've seen them, it's basically a plastic, a, a, a capsule made out of plastic that what it does is it, is it gives us the ability to have the patient enclosed in a structure that limits the spread of uh, uh, their aerosolized secretions. Um, it allows, depending on how they're built, it allows for the providers to be able to introduce their equipment, stick their hands inside the capsule, and still maintain a physical barrier between themselves and, and the patient. And I mentioned that I've seen some things as creative as plastic and wood or plastic and PVC. Again, whatever it takes, uh, you know, whatever, whatever we think is it's appropriate, whatever we can get our hands on, as long as it's, uh, we're willing to, to try things out. And if we can afford to buy the, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the state of the art equipment, then why not? Absolutely. Yeah. That's uh, interesting that you mentioned that one of our nurse managers actually, um, you know, as we were dialing up and uh, we're having multiple patients that required intubation actually went to the dollar store and purchased all of their ponchos. There you go. Um, you know, not fancy, not sophisticated, but you know, even if it improved our safety by one to 2%, um, it was worth it for a dollar or two. Absolutely. And those are, again, that, that's what I'm talking about. Some of those creative ways. We just have to be ready to, to, to take on those ideas and, 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 and not implement them because we think we're crazy. You know, we, this, is time, this is the time to be crazy and to think about things that we haven't thought about before. And we, we can talk about now about logistical considerations. There are so many things that, that need to be taken into account. And we've hit on some of these points already. But how many rescuers do we have available to be able to treat a patient properly. How, many, how much information do we have and how credible is the information that comes in via 911 that says to us that the, the, as far as the patient's age and, where, and what was the last time the patient was seen normal or whether the patient was witnessed uh, in, in the moment they collapsed. Um, bystander CPR is a big one. It was their proper bystander CPR. We know that if any patient who survives cardiac arrest has received some sort of CPR and that is, that is one of the major components of that patient's survival. So if we can accurately uh, find out that information uh, as we respond to the scene, it's going to be important for us to take that into account as well. Is the scene safe? We know right off the bat the scene is not safe. The enemy is there. COVID is there. We have enough information uh, via a proper um, telephone screening system by, uh, by asking the appropriate questions. If we have enough information to determine that the patient is going to be at risk of, of being infected with COVID-19, we already know the enemy is there. So that seems to be considered not safe until we are fully protected with proper PPE. But even, but even with that, again, there are all the things, all the barriers that we can add. We have to consider the patient location. There's a very, very big difference between working a patient who is laying in bed and, and, and happen to have a cardiac arrest episode while they're in bed, or they collapse and now they're laying down on the carpet floor, versus a patient who had the same thing happen to them when they were in the restroom and now their body's wedged in between the toilet and the shower. And those are things that we have to take into account. I've, I've been at scenes where the, where the patient um, it just, just can't be accessed. It's just, 
and those delays, those delays add up to the pressure and add up to that, to that question where we get to a point where we say, how much time have we wasted? How much, how much effort has, has, has not been put in due to all these considerations? The weather, uh, the inclement weather can cause delay. The patient could be, could be in, in, in an accident and inclement weather might provide, might, might, you know, might give us some, some barriers that we have to take into account. Patient size and weight, how, how effective is going to be CPR on a patient that is overweight, morbidly overweight, overweight, and who needs uh, six, seven, eight people to be able to move them from one location to the next, even to load them on their stretcher. How effective is gonna be um, CPR and, and anything else that we can do for those patients? We talked about PPE. We talked about uh, the time it takes to prep. We don't want our crews to, to have to don their PPE while they're responding to the call. One thing is to put on a pair of gloves or a pair of goggles, even a, even, even a mask, that's not a problem. But what happens with having to put a, a full Tyvek suit on before they actually can enter the, the premise where the patient may be? That those delays also, but also have to be taken into account. And some departments have established protocols in which they say that if they have a third responder in the back of the ambulance, while the two in the front are responding, the one in the back is getting dressed. And when they get to the scene, that one, that one provider immediately jumps off the, the, the rescue and accesses the patient with a defibrillator um, with them. So if the patient needs to be shocked, so that that shot be provided uh, timely in a timely fashion. That's one way of trying to get over that issue. But again, it still possesses, it still poses some sort of risk and those are things that we have to, to take into account. And the last point that I want to mention here is DNR orders. How clear are they? How, how well uh, educated and trained are our crews in terms of being able to identify and to vet a proper DNR form uh, at the moment when something like that happens, when we respond to a patient that has a part, that's in cardiac arrest, and now we have to make that decision. Of course, having a proper DNR would facilitate things to be able to make that decision right then and there. But we know from experience, that's not always as easy as, as, it, as it sounds in theory. There might be issues, there might be issues that have to do with the document itself not being available or just not being valid. And I'm curious to know what your experience has been in any of these areas or over in your system, Doc. Yeah, I could not agree with you more on all these uh, considerations. I actually wanted to ask you, um, in regards to bystander CPR and the dispatcher, um, did you guys alter your protocols in regards to the dispatcher in regards to your screening questions themselves for cardiac arrest? And I thought, you know, preparing in advance as you're on your way to a cardiac arrest call, um, having the providers gown up in the appropriate PPE was a fantastic idea. Can you talk more about those two? Topics? So absolutely. We, so we, when we first started, and, I, and I, I'm going back to the beginning of March when we started talking about, um, you know, implementing all the things that we had already started putting down on paper. And, and we know that one of the first questions we asked, of course, is signs and symptoms. And we talked about fever greater than 100.5. We talked about um, uh, cough. We talked about shortness of breath. And, and then we talked about travel. And travel, the travel question, that was a big one. So we, we uh, actually went back to our Ebola crisis back in November of 2014. And you remember, mm -hmm. we learned a lot from Ebola. And, and, we, and that's what we started. And we said, okay, well, let's, let's start practicing the same, the same steps that we took for Ebola. And let's put them in the context of COVID-19. As we started educating ourselves, like the rest of the world was doing it also, uh, in terms of how to handle COVID-19. And we knew that that was going to be the first thing we needed to do. We needed to get our dispatches to have an active role in being able to screen calls by always asking the appropriate questions. And those are some of the questions, symptoms, and again, initially, the history of travel. When we started talking about some cases from China and Singapore and uh, Korea and uh, Iran, and then Italy came into the picture and Spain, and then next thing you know, it's all over the world and it's in the US. So then, then suddenly the travel question became irrelevant because once we know, realized that that the possibility of uh, having COVID signs and symptoms and not having been even out of the country um, was, was there. So we continue to evolve those, those processes. Our dispatch, I have to say, embracing, uh, you know, embracing these questions and actually asking them accordingly and providing our responding crews with accurate information in terms of uh, that the patient was a positive, um, you know, COVID-19 patient based on their initial screening. We even added processes in place, sort of like arriving to the scene of the patient and maintaining distance unless it was absolutely necessary that we had to make contact with the patient. Having the patient come outside of their house to have them out in the open, handing the patient a, a surgical mm -hmm. mask for them to put on their face, 
having handing the patient hand sanitizer for them to actually sanitize their hands before we even started the questioning, all these things became important. And again, I keep talking about all these components being being significant when we add them all up as opposed to one or two or three at a time. So we we talked to our crews about the importance of following the procedures, following the A, B, C, D, E, as opposed to the A, the D, and maybe the F, because I want to skip some. No, we want to follow the entire process. That was important for us. That was that was that was extremely important, and 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 continues to be important. And those questions continue to be polished up, continue to be continue to be um, updated, and and uh, our dispatcher's role continues to be the same. We've even talked about telemedicine. We've we've done, gone to a point where we're ready to start. Uh, utilizing telemedicine to be able to communicate with these patients and find out whether they need to be examined as COVID-19 patients or possible COVID-19 patients or not. And even as to whether they need to be transported to the emergency room or not, mm. or, they sh or should they be left at home with the proper care, follow-up, support system, everything they need to continue to recover as opposed to bring them to the hospital. So all these things are important. Now, when it comes to cardiac arrest, absolutely. What we have done is we have made emphasis on our community uh, being ready to recognize First of all, the, symptoms, the signs and symptoms of cardiac arrest and take action by doing proper CPR. We utilize things like pulse point, you know, that alerts mm -hmm. our community when a cardiac arrest event is happening. But we have added also all the components related to people maintaining safety and distance and, and also be, being careful not to get themselves uh, in a position where they could be infected. Now, the good thing is that people are still willing to help. People are still willing to do the right thing. And we've been able to, to, to send that message to our community that, 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 you know, even though there's difficulties and there's things we have to keep in mind, we can continue to, to, to assist when someone uh, is in need of, of, of CPR. That's great. One of the things that I'd like to underscore there is, um, you know, in regards to the psychology of EMS providers, it's more important than ever to not skip the steps within the protocol because it's really for our own protection. And, um, you know, ensuring that you have placed your appropriate PPE is incredibly important because we're trained when there's a disaster and people are running one way, our training is to go straight to the problem and see how we can help and try and save lives. But during the pandemic under disaster protocol operations, we really have to ensure our own safety. And that's not only so that we can protect our own families, but it's also that so you can stay in the game. Because like you said, a war is all about the long game. It's not something that's on a case-by-case -case or patient-by-patient -patient basis. We need to maintain our own health so that as a workforce, we can continue to respond and provide emergency care. And that really starts by following the protocol appropriately, ensuring that we do have the correct PPE on. And what PPE were you recommending for your crews, specifically in regards to cardiac arrest? So what we have done is we have we have strengthened. Um, we always go back to the basics. I like go. I like the idea of going back to the basics. And the basics are double pairs of gloves, two pairs of gloves, um, uh, an N95 mask, goggles with full eye protection, and a Tyvek suit that provides uh, uh, splash protection uh, to our crews. When we when we again, and, and that's only in the PPE area. Of course, we have other systems in terms of negative pressure ventilation in the back of our rescues, and ways to separate the driver from the uh, rear compartment, and all those things. And also, once the patient is being turned over to the hospital, the proper disinfection, which I'll talk about in a, in a couple of minutes. But in terms of PPE, that's what we have done, and we have we have stressed to our crews the, the, again, particularly for cardiac arrest patients, to to have their full protection on. Uh, but even with that. As I was mentioning to you in a, a conversation earlier today, we have found ourselves um, being notified of patients that we treated early, early into the process when, when we were not uh, uh, still having our crew wear Tyvek suits. They still had uh, uh, gloves and, and uh, uh, eye protection and N95 masks, but no Tyvek suits. And we have had cases in which we have worked some patients that had zero signs and symptoms of COVID-19, but then the hospital tested them and they came back positive. And still, we have had zero uh, infections in my department. So that makes us that makes us think that uh, everything we've done so far um, has worked. And even even the level of protection of wearing a Tyvek suit uh, has worked and has uh, provided the the benefit to, to stay clear of infection. But even when we didn't have them on, um, we still didn't have any positive cases. I'm not saying I'm not advocating for not wearing them. No, I think we should always wear them, and and especially in cases of cardiac arrest. But um, so far, our experience has been that, uh, you know, thanks, thank God we have not had any, any positive cases. And that's due to all of the precautions that we have taken. Amazing. And of course, the Tyvek suits are single use, correct? 
Correct, single use. But listen, like any of the other systems, you know, there are there are different types of suits out there. There are some that are washable, that are that are you know that that you can decontaminate. And if and if that is what is required, we should all be willing to think about uh, the possibility of uh, of uh, you know resorting to those processes and putting in place whatever practices we need to to be able to reutilize. Uh, some of this equipment if needed, uh, if we get to that point, but, you know, after proper disinfection, of course. Now, um, yeah, I think that's a great point, too. I think with the, all the efforts to flatten the curve, there was a real scare that the PPE burn rate um, would greatly exceed uh, our capacity. And thankfully, it seems like the flattening the curve has significantly helped the trajectory of this virus and then also allowed our, you know, manufacturers to catch up in regards to, um, you know, supplying frontline personnel with what they need to safely execute their mission. I have a couple of questions regarding the ambulance itself. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that the ambulance, you're able to um, sort of like change the flow and uh, make it negative pressure in the back. Is that something that uh, had always been a capability or had you built that in? Um, and then I'd love for you to talk more about uh, decontaminating the ambulance post call as well. Absolutely. So, so when it comes to the the, the ambulance system itself, and, and it's funny that in Florida we call them rescue trucks. So it's mm -hmm. like, it's hard for me to to kind of go, but but I'll go back back and forth between ambulance and rescues. And our rescues are the the, the biggest the biggest size type rescues, and and they come with a, a negative pressure system in which you can actually turn on a, a switch and the exhaust will actually uh, actively remove. Uh, air from the back of uh, of the rescue, while at the same time you can bring bring in fresh air from the outside into the mm. back compartment. There's also a pass through compartment between the cab where, uh, where the driver uh, sits and and the, the patient compartment. And that pass through compartment we have decided to temporarily see, uh, seal it uh, to um, not spread any any um, any secretions in, in the in the ambient air towards the cab where the driver is driving the rescue. Now, the driver is going to continue to drive the rescue wearing goggles and, and, and an N95 mask, but we also recommend for them to lower the windows. And we want them to, to do that while they drive with the windows down, let them fresh air come in. The uh, negative pressure system in the back of the ambulance uh, allows for the, for the uh, air to be uh, uh, exchanged and refreshed every few minutes. And that we, we found that that's also an effective way to keep the back of the rescue clean. Now, when it comes to decontamination, there are many things that, uh, that are being used out there. There's many, many commercially available devices. And you could go from as simple as a simple spray bottle and a rag and the proper chemical to utilizing any kind of commercially available uh, electrostatic, uh, you know, uh, aerosolizing machine that costs thousands of dollars. Again, I'm not advocating for anything. I'm just saying we need to be willing to look at what's available, what we can afford and put those, those things in place. One thing that has was worked for us tremendously is that um, about three years ago, our, our local county jurisdiction, our local county uh, hospitals, they were able to get through a grant in a one uh, electrostatic aerosolization disinfection machine mm. per hospital. Well, we were able to dust them off and, 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 and you know, refurbish them and put them in place and, and we acquired the proper, uh, the proper recommended chemical and those machines remain at the emergency room in the decontamination room. So when my crews arrive with a possibly infected COVID-19 patient, once the patient has been turned over to the emergency room, the crews go back at, outside, plug in the machine, spray the back of the rescue, spray the outside, every compartment, spray the equipment and let it sit for the appropriate kill time as recommended by the manufacturer and then wipe down any, any wet surfaces. And at that point, the rest is considered clean. We go into another process now of decontamination for our crews, in which they're also able to, even as some of the hospitals, doff their PPE properly, dispose of it the right way, also even shower and change into a, into a fresh set of clothes even before they leave the hospital. Mm. This is done with the proper coordination so that they don't have to rush to that process so that they can, they can now go back and get in their decontaminated truck with their clothes in a sealed bag, go back to the station, put them in the washer, and they're good to go. We have, again, and these processes are all spelled out, A, B, C, D, E for our crews to follow. And I have to say very proudly that our crews have taken all those precautions and all, all those recommendations and have put them into practice. Again, zero infections so far. We're really happy about all the work that everyone's been doing. Incredible.
We talked about many different things, signs of death. We talked about Dr. Olson the last, the last time we spoke about and how some departments have, have actually had to go back and restate their protocols in terms of what to look for in patients before they decide to work them or not work them in terms of presumptive versus conclusive signs of, of death. We've talked about mechanical CPR versus manual CPR. And, and, and COVID times, this is the time to think about, you know, what's effective, what could work, maybe what wouldn't work. Technology, I mentioned earlier, this different things like real endoscopy, ventilators, capsules, all these systems, you know, all these things that are so important. And we know there's evidence out there. There's many studies that tell us about, you know, between mechanical and manual CPR, between direct visualization during an ET2 placement versus real endoscopy. This is where you guys, and I put it on you, Doc, as a medical director with your leadership to sit down and go, okay, well, what works for us? Because we know that this is not a, a cookie cutter type of, type of deal. This, this, this has to be done depending on our, own, our individual systems and our capacities and our capabilities and the things that we can afford. And, and those things are just too important to pass up. But the next thing I think that we should talk about, Doc, is, is the families. What do you think? And the impact uh, uh, that, that this time has on families. It's absolutely devastating for folks, um, especially who have lost, you know, and then there are certain families who have lost multiple people within the same household, too. And I don't think we're appreciating the compound effects, uh, the psychological effects that, um, you know, just shutting down the country and the economic challenges and you have folks dying in your family and you're uh, you've lost your job and you're not earning an income. And it's just um, such a compound effect of, of psychological challenges that we're going to need to heal from. Um, after this is all said and done. This is a topic that we can discuss for hours when we talk mm. about the families, the patients, our own rescuers, our own families. I'm going to tell you right now, I see a lot of stress happening in my, in my you know, close uh, uh, social in, uh, environment. I see my friends dealing with stress. I see my own family dealing with stress. I see things happening that, that I haven't seen before. And when we think about the, our COVID, our possibly COVID-infected patients and their families and the effect that this times have on them. It's just something that it blows my mind, you know, the things that we have talked about. I was having this conversation with a good, a good friend of mine about the fact that when we joined DMS, we didn't think about having to wear ballistic protection, you mm -hmm. know, bulletproof vests and helmets. We didn't think about active shooter back then. You know, it was a thing that maybe happened, but it didn't happen the way it did. We didn't think about having to wear PPE on every patient encounter. Mm -hmm. We didn't think about having to go to a patient's home and work in them and then know or at least have some level of certainty that once we left that door, um, well, once we closed the door to the ambulance, that family may never see their relative again. Those things are huge and we have to, have, we have to be ready to, to consider that. We have to be ready to consider also the fact that if we run to a patient's home and the patient is, is suspected of being infected with COVID-19, the family should be, should be also, also uh, suspected of being infected as well. So now there's certain things that we have to take into account. That's the time to also start talking about the family in general. And when, when we think we should recommend for them as far as steps to take now that their loved one is being taken to the hospital for them to now try to stay safe and free of infection if they're not already infected. Everything changes right there. You're not dealing with one patient only. You're dealing with an entire family. You're dealing with an entire household and that environment around that patient that now could also be infected. Empathy. These are, these are difficult times, and these are times where empathy should be at the highest point. This is the time when neighbors need to support neighbors. This is the time when providers need to support their own uh, cohorts and have those conversations about what people need and, and, and what is affecting them mentally, psychologically, socially. My uh, old medical director used to, to talk simply about one thing that he, was, that he believed very strongly in, and he called it the yo mama rule. You got to treat every patient, as, every patient as if they were your own mama. You have to think mm. about the fact that this person you're treating is somebody's parent, somebody's child, somebody's spouse, and, and, and those people are going to suffer. And the, the, the way you handle that patient in that environment, whether they are in cardiac arrest or not, the way you handle that call, the way you handle the way you handle the patient and the family, the way you handle yourself and how professionally you you paint yourself in front of everybody is going to define that moment in history for that family. Because time is gonna pass by. We're gonna get over this. And I'm gonna tell you right now, there are families that are going to have deep scars from this, if not just physically, because maybe they had the disease, maybe they were infected, maybe they went to the hospital, or they lost a loved one or simply because of the fact that somebody, some, somebody in their family was handled, was managed by a, by a crew of EMS providers, and maybe for, for them, 
the the experience was even worse than they expected based on the way the providers acted and we just i just want my 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 colleagues around the country and the world to think about that how they portray themselves now is going to have a marked impact in people's lives for years to come um think about the fact that that patient who's in the back of that ambulance getting ready to go to the hospital there's a really good chance you mentioned it earlier that they're going to die alone they're going to die at a, in a hospital bed and the family might not even know they will for, for sure not have a chance to visit them. They may not even be able to have any kind of telephone or video, FaceTime contact or anything. And maybe the next step in their lives is to get that phone call saying that their loved one has died and they didn't get a chance to say goodbye. So I've seen, I've seen this happen. I know a friend of mine in New York had, had a patient in the back of the rescue where he had that moment where he felt strongly about the fact that that patient was possibly not coming back home. And he asked the family, he asked the daughters, he asked the patient's daughters, do you want to take a minute to say goodbye? Because mm -hmm. he saw the, the look on their face and he saw that, that horrified look that they may never see their dad ever again. And he actually did tell them, go ahead. I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes. Say your goodbyes. What would you have to do? To their dad, who was fully aware of what was happening, but was going to the hospital with COVID-19 symptoms, signs and symptoms. That's just horrifying. Mm -hmm. We have to put ourselves in the position of those people, the family members, and our pro colleague providers who have experienced this kind of trauma. So we have to also think about the trauma that our own providers are going to experience for years to come with these memories fresh in their mind about how they have to deal with those moments. We've got to talk about that as well. It, and, and I hope everyone in the country is talking about that. We have to think about what's going to happen with the body if we decide not to transport a cardiac arrest patient who's highly suspected of being infected with COVID-19. What to do with the body, how to protect the rest of the family again. And, and when we see what's happening in other countries like Ecuador, where there, there's stories about things being, things happening there that never happened before, where people were left at home, uh, uh, you know, with their dead loved ones uh, for days and even a couple of weeks at a time. And we mm. know what can happen in terms of uh, the body decomposition and things like that. This is just horrifying things that we haven't had to deal with in the past. I, I mentioned this to a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine who happened to be a responder during the uh, Haiti earthquake. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he said to me was that was exactly what we had to do in Haiti. We had to let uh, bodies pile up, um, you know, for days uh, at a time because there was no way to handle them. Again, wartime medicine. These are the things that we had never talked about that now we just have to keep into, in mind. And I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers, Doc. This is a conversation that has to happen between the experts and leadership and, and again, come up with answers and come up with direction for our crews. Yeah. It's um, very challenging to say the least. And even um, in regards to um, death and dying, I see your photo. It looks like it's a, a funeral. Even yeah. um, the concept of funerals has changed dramatically because, you know, we cannot have these types of public gatherings. So folks are dying alone and being entered into the ground or, um, you know, whatever the cultural preference is, you know, the body is passing. And then the families don't even have an opportunity to really grieve together. Um, so incredibly challenging all around. Absolutely. Uh, the, the very difficult times, very, 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 uh, you know, ex stressful times. And these are, this, this is the moment in which we need to reevaluate how we've done things and, 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 and what are we learning from this? I, I can tell you for sure we're going to come out with a, a, a wealth of knowledge uh, on how to, deal, how to deal with pandemics after this, after this thing passes. And uh, uh, I, just, I just hope that whatever it is that comes up next, we went through we went through, uh, you know, H1N1 and the swine flu and Zika and, uh, and now, you know, and now mm -hmm. this, now COVID-19. What's, what's next? Who knows? Let's mm -hmm. just hope that we're better. Let's just hope that we have learned and then we can, we can put all these, all these lessons together um, and be, be ready to handle the next pandemic or whatever it happens to be in a more efficient manner and hopefully, um, you know, uh, learn not just from the logistical and procedural aspect of things, but also from the psychological uh, in terms of support, in terms of consideration for one another uh, after dealing with this uh, pandemic. Chief, that's a great way to um, end on a positive. Uh, we're going to get stronger at, uh, by having to go through this. There's no question about that. And I just want to take an opportunity to applaud your leadership uh, during these times of pandemic and crisis. Um, you know, not having a single uh, affected member uh, is an incredible accomplishment, actually, and it just shows that your workforce is that much more resilient, that they're able to provide and protect and care for your own community um, and stay healthy and make sure that their families are staying healthy so that they are committed to the mission. So congratulations on that. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you, Doc, and congrats to you, too. Congrats on the work you're doing in New York. Uh, keep, 
continue to keep everyone safe and uh, I appreciate very much the invitation uh, to do this with you. Um, thank you very much. I'm humbled by your invitation. I'm honored too. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And I'm sure um, some of our um, EMS nation is going to have questions or they may say, hey, Chief, I have an extra question on this. How can folks get in touch with you? Sure, they can, they can contact me at my email address. Uh, it's going to be J Cardona, and that's the first uh, initial of my first name, Juan. So J Cardona, C A R D O N A, at coralsprings.org. And Coral Springs is the name, of, the name of my department where I work. So the email address is J Cardona at coralsprings.org. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you so much for your time, sir. This is Chief Juan Cardona and Faison Arshad wishing everyone a safe tour.